The short game is listener supported on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show and join us on our Discord, head to theshortgame.net or patreon.com slash the short game. Welcome back to the short game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I am Reagan Kelly, and I am joined this week by my two early riser coffee drinking co hosts, Laura Dash and Shane Kelly. Uh, that's right, we are recording uh, this show in the morning, which we never do. This is usually an evening recording. You know, we, we, uh, we put our kids to bed or uh, do whatever it is that, that people with no children do in the evenings. <laughs> and then, Laura. And then, uh, and then we, we record this show. But uh, due to circumstances, we are recording this at 9 o'clock in the morning. A uh, real early one today. I believe childless people simply binge watch uh, Succession, uh, and I, I'm not sure if that's. <laughs> I mean, we're true. caught up, so yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't I'm watched still... a TV show in years. Still creeping my way through season one, one episode a week. Mm. Oh, that's lovely, though. <laughs> well, speaking of creeping our way through uh, things, we're we're actually that's not really a good transition. I was going to try to say we're creeping. Our, like I don't really hear if there's anything creeping about the game that we're talking about this week. I was trying for a transition there, but halfway through I realized it made no sense. So I'll just introduce the game. We are talking about the latest game from uh, short game uh, bestie uh, Turnfollow. I say that because we really, really liked their previous game, Wide Ocean Big Jacket. Uh, And this week we're talking about their latest release, which is called Before the Green Moon. And this is a really weird one for the show, but I'm super glad that we played it, or uh, at least I am. I I, I loved it. Um, Before the Green Moon is a farming sim set in a community at the base of a space elevator. And uh, you are farming and uh, whiling away the time until it is your time to leave for the moon. Wide Ocean Big Jacket really struck us as the kind of game that we love. Uh, it had a uh, a great story um, of the sort that you usually don't see in video games. Uh, your your lead character was like a, a teenage girl in the 70s named Mord, who just goes on a love, really good camping trip. Love Mord. Big fan of Mord. Thank you, Mord. Dirtbag of the Year 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. So, yeah, you know, we need we need more mords uh, in our I was I was hoping for more mords uh, in in this particular game. But, uh, you know, say la vie. Uh, there are some possibly mord esque figures. But uh, th- this this one is a lot more of a traditional game um, in a very specific gaming tradition of the farming simulator game. So if you have played a Harvest Moon, and it, in fact, it really hues to the graphical style of like an N64 era rendition of that, which uh, is something that I never even experienced in that era. I think I, I have only had experience with some of the early Harvest Moons and then more recently Stardew. So this yeah. was an interesting thing to check out. Yeah, I've never played a 3D farming sim, quite frankly. I've only played the Stardew Valley style or Harvest Moon style, if you want to be actually <laughs> more specific, because that's what they were borrowing from. So that it was interesting to have a mechanic that is incredibly familiar. I mean, I played way too much Stardew Valley. But um, a lot of this game is... You farm for just a little bit, and then you try to explore the fa- the community. That's how I played Stardew too. So that mm-hmm. felt very familiar. The mechanics are familiar. If you've played them before, uh, the 3D-ness, I did have to draw a map for the town because I'm a little baby. Um, but I think it, it is just a little bit skewed. I mean, there's a green moon, and it's a the, you start off the game with a simulator where you can do everything but adjust your hair color, normally the only thing you can customize. So like everything was a little tilted from what I was expecting. And I liked that. Um, yeah. I, the thing that really drew me to this, um, I, apart from just it being from a developer that we've you know enjoyed their work in the past, is that you know, we don't play a lot of farming sims. Farming sims are not a genre that typically falls into our you know 10 hour or less remit. Um, by the way, I did play this for about 12 hours. I got to the point where I could have seen credits at about eight, but I carried on um, to see out some story stuff. So just you know, level setting about the length. 
Um, this is uh, this is a more than most farming sims. This has a very specific setting and story. Um, most farming sims, the story is usually the the like a rehash of the Harvest Moon style story, where wow, you've inherited a farm, but it's gone to shit. Time to clean it up, break those rocks, and plant some plants, and maybe go on a date with the town weirdo. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like the story. And that's fine. That's a good story. Um, but mostly with those sorts of games, I think the draw is sort of creating your own story in this sort of generic setting in many cases. I know there are more, you know, there's like fantasy farming sims and so on. There's a lot There's a lot of breadth in that genre. But really, Stardew Valley killed the farming sim. It's, it you know, it became the forever farming sim. That if you're a farming sim person, you're just going to play Stardew Valley forever. And, and you not can. A lot of, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. And there's there's nothing wrong with that. And and like, and there's a lot of, there's a lot to do in something like Stardew. I've, I've played a little bit of that game, but like barely, because I just know it's not, it's not a short game, right? Um, but I was drawn to this because it is. It has the mechanics of a farming sim, but it's trying, I think, to tell a, a, a different sort of story than you see in one of those. And you get that right from the start with the description that they've given to the game. It's a science fiction farming slash life simulation game. So first of all, science fiction doesn't intersect with farming sims very often. That was very interesting on its face. Mm-hmm. And then it says, explore a small community at the base of a space elevator during the days and seeding, seasons leading up to your departure for the moon. And we learn a lot about the setting pretty early in the game. And it's a very unusual setting. Um, so uh, this, this, this seems to be, first of all, the, um, the, the moon, uh, you have to buy a ticket to go and live on the moon. And the moon is green in that, like, presumably it's been terraformed. Um, and it seems to be where all the upper crust people live. It's where if you can afford it, you go and live on the moon. Um, if you can't afford to leave, it, it always refers to the earth as our earth with a capital O, our earth. If you can't a- afford to leave our earth, uh, then you have to, you know, uh, live in these sort of uh, post climate disaster ruins. Uh, but interestingly, like the moon is this like hyper capitalist, u- you know, uber society. And our earth seems to be mostly in a sort of, um, I don't know, socialist or communist or something. It, people live in these comms or communities. Um, they don't have uh, a native money, although they sometimes have to interact with the moon people with Mooney, which is very funny, moon <laughs> money. Um, and um, you know, the, you're, you're, you're playing as a character who's just finished some kind of you know, I don't know, youth training program called Young Farmers. And you've been uh, and you're traveling to uh, a community at the base of one of if not the only I'm not sure it seems like there used to be more space elevators, but some of them are out of commission. Um, You're traveling to this this uh, community at the base of a space elevator, and you are assigned a farm. And you're uh, farming and shipping your crops up to the moon in exchange for Mooney, which uh, you plan to exchange for a ticket to escape uh, up to the moon uh, and, you know, do whatever it is that people do up there. We don't actually learn that much about what moon society is like, but you do sort of see it in the, you know, in the economic fringes. This is a really strange um, you know, it's it's a really strange setting, and I thought it was really intriguing, and I, I was I was really drawn into it from that angle. Yeah, your intro to this world is Carol, who is the administrator, just a overall chill, chill dude, Carol. And I think one of my favorite early moments was weirdly the you stand in front of a monitor and you're seeing about getting signed up for an account to get to the moon. And there's just pages and pages and pages of policy. And you do learn that farmers are on the list of people who can have like a slightly cheaper ticket. And so you're like, Oh yeah, this will be easy. And then you go to the thing and it is a, an, what looks like an exorbitant amount. I think of it's a hundred thousand Mooney, mm-hmm. um, which yeah, at the start of the game seems impossible because like you're, you're shipping rice up to the moon for like five bucks, a three crop rice. Or yeah. um, and it feels so out of reach. And I thought at the beginning, that was the point of the game is that it's this like socialist capitalist nightmare where you're never going to get money. And then it, it does get easier and things do move. But I just went to let folks know, like, it is not an impossible game. That is not the no. point of this game. This is not a game about grinding. And I thought it was at the beginning. 
um, which really, I think, colored my first hour or two of the game. I'd love to know, Shane, how did you feel when you started this one? Well, um, when I got started with this game, um, I I have enjoyed some of these farming sim type games in the past, but I was honestly a little bit um, maybe disappointed that this game wasn't what I was kind of thinking after having experienced Wide Ocean Big Jacket. Um, my my time with Wide Ocean Big Jacket was really, uh, just to put it a little bit in context, Wide Ocean Big Jacket has really dynamic uh, characters that are placed in very specifically in scenes like a silent film. You would be cutting back and forth between these scenes with these characters who were just expressively posed and and everything and then you would the dialogue would be these full screen dialogue cards right um very you know old school silent film and the thing about it is um it is about conversations where you know the conversations that happen are those sort of conversations that pop up when you are just sitting with people like it, it, the conversations in wide open ocean, big jacket. There was a quote from um, Patrick Klepek, uh, RIP waypoint, by the way, mm. uh, oh, where he oh, said, um, you know how we sometimes use jokes to avoid more truthful conversations. Wide ocean, big jacket is about when the jokes run out and you've accidentally stumbled into having a conversation about something. The second your eyes go wide and you mutter, Oh no, before re- later realizing these kinds of moments were formative in developing a sense of self, a cycle of personal improvement that starts your in your teens and carries you through adulthood. I loved that. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, this game, um, y- you y- you can get people to tell you one thing a day, which is yeah. typical for farming sims. Like you go up and and you you have one piece of dialogue, which by the way, in this, for most of the people, is going to be something like, "I sure do hate rice." <laughs> and then you ask them again and they're like, all right, then. And you click yep. on them again and it's like, all right, then. And I'm like, okay, okay, this isn't exactly what I was hoping for from this game. My my early experience, though, was pretty excited. I really liked the fact that they had a character creator. I love making a little guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to know about your say, little guy. The way, on the topic of the character creator, like you have a, the option of choosing a default character or creating mm-hmm. your own and the default character is the weirdest looking little yeah. gremlin i've ever seen mm-hmm. with a little like exposed belly button and weird high shorts and like looks like a like a strange troll and then you can use the character creator to create like you know your own guy and uh and it, it's pretty pretty flexible but they all look to me like characters out of Shane mentioned the N64. I think that's a good touch point, but it's like, this is looks like a beta N64 game. Like it looks a lot like, like screenshots I've seen of the lost, um, um, uh, like mother three N64. Like uh, if you're trying to do seventies claymation in an N64 mm-hmm. polygon limitation yeah, and everything has like, like the, everything's textured, but it's like all the textures are like slightly weird, slightly off. Mm-hmm. Things are either too shiny or have like, like, you know, weird, weird flesh. Color and the palette is them. very strange. It's very a very, yeah. yeah. I love the aesthetic by the way. Don't get me wrong. I, I might be, you know, kind of saying it looks bad or weird but it's like this is a, this is a trash aesthetic it's like mm-hmm. it, it kind of goes with the with the fact that like this looks like th- the world around you looks like everything was at one point built up and then has just seen some shit via yeah. like it's very star disaster. wars to me mm-hmm. yeah i could see that too um, yeah yeah it has well, this and, and we've been seeing Moss so Isley many quality. pastels yeah we've been seeing so many pastels and candy colored uh vibes this is a very distinct palette and i think mm. it works for the game yeah the you know after the uh the brown ages of like the 2010s and everybody sort of pulled the rip cord on on like well hell let's bring some color back to our game it is interesting to see a game like this that's like well for the story that we're telling we are going to use a lot of brown and i actually really quite quite liked that the look of the game was was a big part of it for me it's more green it's just greens on greens on greens but not yeah. like a vibrant green. It's all that yeah, brown. Except for the moon, which is quite vibrant. Mm-hmm. Um, so to Shane's point about the story, like this, it, it doesn't just have these like, you know, one line of dialogue, talk to people things. It does have, a, it does have cut scenes, but you don't get them every day. This game, I think when I got to the end of it, I'd played through over a hundred in game days. And um, 
each day, you know, you, you can spend some time at your farm, um, doing things like the standard stardew type of stuff, you know, planting yep. plants, digging them up. Um, you do eventually, uh, acquire new tools. It's got a whole inventory system and, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, in some ways it's a little bit underutilized. There were whole like aspects to the inventory system. Like you could apparently upgrade things like your, your in-game UI by like, I, I at one point I bought a new watch and it just changed the in-game UI for what time of day it was. Um, so like there's a whole system there that is a little bit underutilized, but you do have multiple different upgrades. You can get to the various tools, things like watering cans and, you know, hose and so on. Um, uh, but the farming stuff is pretty much what you'd expect, except it's a little bit stripped down. You've got maybe four or five main crops that you can grow. There's two seasons, a wet season and a dry season, and it alternates between them. And they have different crops that can grow in each. And, um, you know, some crops like, for example, banana trees, you can plant them once and they'll produce all season. Um, or other things like rice or cabbages, you plant them once and then you dig them up and you have to plant something new. And there's also like dynamic weather. So, you know, sometimes it will be raining and the rain actually damages your stamina bar um, unless you have special items like a poncho that are very expensive. So there's, you know, there's, there's a lot to it, uh, but it is a pretty stripped down farming sim in that like you've got a pretty small farm. There's only a certain number of crops you can grow. Um, and uh, it takes a little while to kind of ramp up. If you really want to min max it, you can eventually be, you know, raking in the money or Mooney. Um, but it's uh, it, it takes it takes time to kind of ramp that up. In the meantime, you have you can go and talk to all of the various people, and sometimes they do just say hey. Um, but sometimes uh, you get quite lengthy cutscenes with them, and the more you hang out with them, the more your relationships with them develop, and so. There are um, about six main characters that you can go and interact with, and each of them has their own little story that you can progress um, and uh, see as much of it as you can before you decide to, you know, cash in your Mooney and buy your ticket and take the ride up the space elevator. Now, to make this slow start a little more concrete there's a welcome party that they say like oh we're gonna we're gonna do a cookout in your first week and then you go to the cookout and it's just two people and it's one of the <laughs> saddest things i've ever seen that is um the opposite of stardew valley where like you join and there's like 60 people or something at your welcome party i'm exaggerating but it, it's a very different vibe this is a community that is um a little closed off like they're welcoming but they're like they've got their own stuff to do um, to compare it a little bit to, um, white ocean, big jacket, I thought of this as like versus like if white ocean, big jacket is like a three minute track you listen to, like, this is like turning on the lo-fi beats to study two channel. It's like <laughs> white ocean, big jacket is much more concentrated. And this one is much more titrated. Like you're going to get little drips of stuff over time. It's much more about like a vibe. Um, that that's the, I didn't play as much as Reagan did, but that's what I got from the first like four or five mm -hmm. hours. Yeah. So, and I, yeah, I played it quite a bit more. Um, I did complete the game. I think Laura and, and Shane did not, and that's okay. The, um, the, the, the plot here does progress. And what I thought was pretty neat about it was like, ultimately, you know, the shape of the plot, right? It's right on the box. It says, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're just sort of spending time in this community and interacting with people until it's time to leave. Um, I had not to not to get into spoiler territory. Maybe we'll do a spoiler break at the end to talk about some of that stuff. But I I did kind of find myself wishing for like like it, part of this whole game is like you're building a community with these people. You know, you're you're integrating yourself into their lives, and um, but you 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 know there's kind of a clock on it, and it feels like you should be able to choose not to leave for the moon, and I suppose you can. Um, but I wasn't able to, maybe I missed something, but I don't think you're able to, to trigger credits without leaving for the moon. I don't think there's like some big choice at the end of the game. You can just continue to stay and continue to farm. Um, uh, we, I won't talk about the actual ending, but the, um, until we get to spoiler break, but like, I guess one thing that I was surprised by was like this, it, 
I, I was, by the time I got to the point where I was like ready to potentially leave for the moon, I almost didn't want to. And maybe that's kind of the point. Um, but it's, uh, it's a, it's a weird vibe there in that, like you spend so much time building relationships with these people. Um, and to the point where like, so there's, there's lots of characters that I really liked. There's, um, Pony who initially in the game tells you, you know, she's a, she's a, um, some kind of, uh, uh, biologic like a plant designer which i guess is a thing you can be in the future and she's you know using her little computer in her little room to to design plants that she can sell you know designs to the moon uh and make her living that way um but as you interact with her you know she rediscovers her joy in actually growing plants and um and you know doing things for herself projects that she starts that aren't directed just for commerce um and also, you know, she's got her own reasons where she never left for the moon and you learn about those. Um, and you can have a, a actually really a romantic relationship with her if you choose to. Um, and there's other characters like Int, this little kid who has a really strange plot. I won't tell you the spoiler details there, but like it had some real left field weird inclusions where I was like, what on earth is going on there? Really, really left strange questions. But also Int is just a fun character, kind of maybe a um, autism coded kid or something like that. Um, and, um, just a, just a cool character to interact with a slow to warm up to you, but, but interesting, um, lots of other great characters too. And, uh, you know, you build these great relationships with them and then ultimately, you know, there's a clock on all of these and that's sort of sad. But one thing that I, I liked about it from a theme perspective was that it's, it's a it's it's a story kind of about um, building community in the face of sort of uh, economic collapse or like in the ruins of capitalism. I thought about a lot about um, Citizen Sleeper while I was playing it because Citizen Sleeper is also a game about like how the only way to survive at the fringes of how did they, how did Citizen Sleeper phrase it? Like the, the ruins of interstellar capitalism. And this is sort of, you're sort of in, in, in the, the dust that, you know, in, in this the game, you're sort of in the dust that interstellar capitalism and climate disaster left behind. Um, but um, uh, it, it's still about how sort of like the only way to survive in that world is to come together and to support each other, you know, mutual aid and community and, and whatnot. And um, makes you sort of reflect on how, like, we're sort of living through that today as well. The you know we're living in the um, maybe uh, different people to different degrees, but we're all sort of living in the wreckage of capitalism. And um, and you know how uh, building community is is sort of the the way that you survive that. And so I, I really appreciated that about this story. But even you know all that did kind of make the ending of, you know, the, the, make the, the, the feeling of leaving for the moon complicated for me because it's a game about building community and, but it's also a game about leaving that community behind. Um, really, really strange and interesting from a theme perspective. Uh, I will give this, uh, credit for the Abzu type thing of Abzu has a, is an underwater game where at some point you can just press a button and just like watch the fish hang out and there are multiple places in here where you can just sit in a chair and stare at the sky and the moon um life is strange had that thing where you could sit on the bed and listen to music i am always very happy in a game that seems to be a lot about vibes when they give you a chance to sit and vibe out and listen to the music or listen to the thing this is often where i'll like sit put it on like go get a new cup of water like i can stay in the game but not at the game um Yes, I am advocating for more games to have built-in screensavers, but like <laughs> I really <laughs> like it. Um, it fits with this game. Um, I find it funny you can also sleep in other people's beds, but um, that's besides uh, you, the point. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, it... it something else that I forgot to mention is that this game has a lot of little secrets in it, like um, mm -hmm. little activities that you can, you can discover. I'm thinking of, so like there, obviously there's the farming aspect, but there's, you can go around. Can, can hunting, I ask, sorry, what, what on, related to that? What on earth was I supposed to be doing with the snails? Because oh, you can sell them to the moon. I sold them and then I felt <laughs> bad. Like the first time I sold a snail, I was like, is are they alive? And then I looked at it, it was like just the shells. And I was like, oh, okay. Why am I selling snail uh -huh. shells? I had also, just there been was so much garbage. around to, uh, 
to all the different people in town and most of them had something funny that they would say if you tried to give them a snail <laughs> and then um I uh like the 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 cook would say I I would cook these up for you but they are too cute. Uh, oh. and, um, <laughs> and then I, I but you you could always go back and get them. They were they kind of refreshed on the on the beach each day. Mm -hmm. And so eventually I made a large pile of them in the on the administrator's desk. Oh, and, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you can, that is you so can much better. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I definitely was just like selling them to the the moon and I guess they're eating them up there or something which is a bit mm -hmm. sad. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of weird nooks and crannies in this game. Um, you know, you can go and uh, find wild chickens in various parts of the world and carry them back to your house and then feed them. You have to go and find or buy ground apples, which I guess are a thing, and uh, and feed them to the chickens. Uh, and then you can get eggs as an alternate uh, source of money or Mooney. Um, there's also, I found there's a, there's a place where you can go underground and if you spend an absolutely unbelievable amount of stamina to break a bunch of rocks in these tunnels, you can break the rocks and get through to find a, a treasure that's buried deep underground that <laughs> I, I think if I'd found it earlier on before I ended up already having my moon ticket, it would have been like worth the whole ticket almost. Um, and there's just like lots of weird little side stuff you can do with the characters. You know, if you progress um, Pony's story to a certain point, she starts inventing weird plants for you to grow. Um, it, there's there's just there's a, a lot of different stuff that you can you can go and do in this game. Probably not as wide as like a lot of farming sims. That's kind of the that's kind of the thing, right? It's like there's a lot of different potential things you could be doing on any given day, and you know you have the the option to like you know, make money in a bunch of different ways or experience different little story elements. And that that's kind of here too. Um, but I was just sort of surprised by it because it does seem on the surface like a very stripped down one of these. But every now and then I would just mm -hmm. discover some new angle, um, new thing that I could be doing. And um, I, I really appreciated that like... <sighs> It's just it's 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 a it's a pretty complete game. It feels like it's got a, there's a lot of there's a lot of potential systems. Each character has an interesting story. Um, there's just a lot going on here, and uh, you know, despite the fact that it's relatively short for one of these, it, it really feels like a like a pretty yeah. full uh, experience. And I didn't feel pressure to. I didn't. Some games like Stardew Valley, if you once you really get things cooking, like you are. Um, you have to favor your farm or the social aspect or the dungeons or the fishing. Like there's too much to do. And here I always felt like I could do my stuff and then go hang out in the city. Like I was never um, stressed about the balancing. It yeah. If you're really trying to grind for, for money um, or if you know, you planted like a full set of crops, you can end up needing to like carefully manage your stamina because sure. if you run out of stamina, um, during the day, you pass out and lose the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. um, um, also, I almost forgot to say, quality of life improvement. Stardew Valley. If you run out of st like, if you get low on like at the, if you're out late at night, it and you you will just fall asleep on the ground, and someone will be <laughs> like, "Why did you not go home and sleep in your bed?" Like it's it is bad. You can just like be out and not have time to get home and fall asleep on the floor. Uh, this one just puts you back on your bed, which I found so much better. I did not have to navigate back to my house. I know some people hate that um, when they do like they they find that to be one of the weird challenges. I hate it in Stardew Valley. I was like, "Yes, please, don't make me fall asleep on the ground." Like just cuts like. Cut to me in my bedroom every time, please. Yeah, I, I like that about it too. And the um, and you can also go and find. I think we mentioned this. You can go and find like beds in various weird places in the world. Yeah. Um, even like there's a there's a there's a bed in the hallway in Pony's apartment building. There's a a bed in a weird spot. Uh, sort of a covered nook over near the space elevator. Yeah. There was a bed underground in that spot where you can grind out those rocks so I could go and sleep there and spend five days grinding rocks if I wanted. Um, just, you know, that I appreciated that. It was kind of neat. Uh, and um, 
it's just it's 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 well designed like they they clearly took a lot of inspiration from the best of the genre mm-hmm. even though they were kind of shooting for something that i think is more narrative focused than focused on being like the greatest farming sim they didn't like they didn't leave out any of the the important sort of quality of life stuff that you would expect it, it it's all there i think if i have one like worry i think they've sort of hid their light under a bushel here the mm-hmm. the farming life sim genre uh, has not only the 800 pound gorilla that is um stardew valley but also you know you you have in that same you've got everything from farmville to farming simulator to the classic harvest moon and and story of seasons and everyone is putting one of these together so um this is a a, a developer and i think a game that has a lot of unique things that they can bring um to this genre but if you are um like this is a um a game where it's very easy to look at it and say oh this is one of those Mm -hmm. um and Mm -hmm. you know you have to really let the experience grow on you to find some of the more unique elements especially in the story um it teases it up front but you have to sink into it Mm mm-hmm yeah, the style of game is the sort of thing where the story grows, you know, season by season. And and so I I really um I I I love the story that these kinds of games usually bring. It's a very it's a trope I like. You've got the city mouse who decides to leave the hustle and bustle of urban life and comes and uh, you know, takes over grandpa's farm. Like but that is the story that all of these have. Um, and this one is very different from that. And, and I, I think it would be, um, uh, you know, it, if I were to ask for kind of one thing in this game, it would be dump a ton of story, story on me right at the front. And they tried mm-hmm. the, the, the thing that I really liked, I, when does the talking bus come back? The, the game <laughs> yes. with a I forgot scene. to mention the talking bus. I want oh the talking God. bus. I didn't always. get the cut. I didn't get to any further conversations with the talking bus, but the, the game begins with you rolling across a, uh, a, 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 a plane's, in a bus to get to this farm and the bus is some sort of AI powered talking bus. And, uh, that, uh, that was, that was great. I wanted a lot more of that kind of, um, cut scene and material. Uh, and it took a long time to get anything, uh, anything even sort of like that. I never got to meet the bus again. So no, unfortunately, I don't think you meet the bus again. I don't think that's an important element of the plot. But I did agree that the bus was awesome. Um, the bus did come back, and and it was it was parked in, in, uh, pretty late in the game. I was like, oh, there's the bus. The bus is back, and then it wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> oh, uh, but yeah, the, there's there's all sorts of like really. Um, I, I sometimes hate the word evocative, but like there's some like really, really evocative bits like the about the, the you know, tell you about the world in this sort of very like show don't tell kind of way. Um, but for me, I guess it was mostly just about the the conversations with the characters. Once you kind of got into the swing of a because um, you'd have to like hang out with a or kind of figure out how to hang out with certain characters, like certain characters like like Elvis, the guy who runs the uh, the mess, which is like the community, um, you know, free dining center that you can always go to to eat um, a muffin or something and refill your stamina, um, which was a great element. And, you know, Elvis has his own schedule. He takes Mondays off, for example. So you have to plan around that if you need the stamina from the food. Um, but you also can can figure out, okay, if I want to build a relationship with Elvis, you eventually learn I have to visit him in the evening because during the day he's busy serving food, but in the evening you can help him clean up. And if you do that often enough, and spend the time to help him clean up, then you begin having deeper and more involved conversations with Elvis. And everybody has something like that, where you have to sort of learn how to spend time with them. And then once you do, you can progress their story and get these sort of more involved cutscenes. And um, I, I tried to stick around at, even after I'd gotten enough money to to buy my way onto the moon. I stuck around for several hours after that, c- kind of progressing the, the story. I ended up with way too much money. I probably should have just stopped farming at that point. Um, but you know, I I you know tried to try to see the, the stories out for all of those characters, um, 
it turns out, by the way, I, I, you know, I learned something from the, um, from the, uh, the community page on steam that I actually missed some stuff with int that I would have been very interested to see. Mm. Um, but, uh, as far as I could tell, there's no way to go back. You know, there's no like multiple save slots on this game. Um, it, you can manually save, but it also auto saves. So there's no, there's no rolling back the clock, uh, in this game. Um, I don't think that most stuff is fully missable until you leave, but once you do leave, you've left. Um, so I think that's about all we have to say for now about all, before the green moon. We're going to uh, do a little uh, out, admin and outro here. Do you guys have time for a little what's making us happy before we uh, roll? And we could do a little spoiler break at the end if we want. Sure. Okay. A little bit. So um, uh, before we outro, um, Shane, what's making you happy this week? Well, uh, this is going to be extremely uh, niche to... Uh to houston people uh, but there's a sure uh so uh just night before last i i got to go out to a kind of alternative comedy thing that has been running in houston for a long time called neo benchy uh oh. neo benchy means uh kind of the practice of producing uh live alternate voiceovers for movies uh, and that's exactly what this is. If you are experienced, if you've experienced something like uh, Mystery Science Theater, or you remember movies like uh, What's Up, Tiger Lily, uh, this mm-hmm. was a uh, fantastic take on that. Um, it, it's it's this is I'll keep this short because this is probably irrelevant to virtually all of our listeners, um, since it is a Houston local uh, comedy thing. But I, I had an absolutely fantastic time. They, they just sort of take over a bar and people bring uh, video clips and then do their own voiceover for it. Uh, some really fun, unique comedy was happening there. So that's something I'm going to try and experience more of as I, as I can. Uh, you know, the, the, the Houston weird alternative comedy scene is a little bit more uh, vibrant than I had realized. There's, there's some fantastic little clubs and stuff. So, um, you know, this is not a, a an actual recommendation for ninety five percent of you uh, who cannot make it to Houston, but uh, you know, look for that sort of thing in your own hometown. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, I, I I'll go next because mine is mine is nerdy and uh, is is also probably not that interesting to most folks. So I'll make it. Brief. <laughs> You're selling it um, super well, Reagan. <laughs> oh, I am. No, that um. So t- this hasn't been a particularly exciting week for me. Nothing really like fun, but. The one thing that has been kind of an interesting project is that I've been needing, um, not needing, needing is totally the wrong word. For whatever reason, I got a weird uh, techie bug in my bonnet that I wanted to get a laptop that wasn't my work laptop. I wanted to like, you know, have have a computer that would be like something I could screw around with in ways that I can't with the one that's provided by my job. Um, and uh, I also simultaneously, because I've had so much fun with the Steam Deck, thought, well, why don't I try doing Linux this time instead of a Mac? And Macs are very expensive. And why would I have, you know, I have a Mac laptop for work. Let me try something different. And so I uh, did a lot of research and, and ended up buying a $200 ThinkPad, um, like an older used ThinkPad, hmm. and uh, running um, Linux on it. I'm running the uh, Pop! OS uh, distribution. And I have to say, like, I mean, you know, this is, again, nerdy, dumb, whatever. But like, $200 buys you a lot of computer, man. If you're looking at like used ThinkPads or whatever, this thing is like, it's got, you know, a nice, uh, like eight core, uh, four core, eight, eight thread i7 and 16 gigs of RAM and an NVMe SSD and a touch screen and, um, like surprisingly an okay battery given that it's five years old and, um, you know, probably running windows it would have been a little creaky but uh but running linux it's like wow this is like a really decent laptop for like 200 bucks and i was also looking at it for like you know i want something that i'd be able to let my kids play around with and if i let them play with my like fancy macbook that's provided by work i would have felt like this would be you know a little too dangerous but like this i feel like it can be a little careless with and it's kind of nice to have like a beater computer for that sort of thing so i was just gonna say you know hey um you know, if you're in the if you're in the MacBook lifestyle like like I am, and you feel like you have to treat your laptop with kid gloves, um, maybe there'd be a place in your life for like a weird beater computer. And I've found that's actually been really really great this week. So uh, I thought I'd recommend. Laura, what's making you happy this week? 
So I have been listening to more and more of a podcast called Screen Drafts, and this is outside of my wheelhouse because each episode is incredibly long. Uh, it's a lot of people talking and debating, and there is, you know, it's a little bit more of the hangout podcast style, which I tend to dislike. Uh, but Screen Drafts is awesome because it is um, what they call competitive. It is what they call competitively collaborative drafts of ranked movie lists. Um, mm. My husband says I am absolutely like, why are you listening to this? The lists are never good. Like the lists at the end are like, <laughs> because they are, people have their own agendas, right? So like mm -hmm. you can veto someone's pick because you want it higher up on the list, but then you don't get to place it back and it like doesn't make it list at all. And people get really worked up. So it is the journey, not the destination. And there is a wiki where you can look up the lists of all these best of lists um, and see them. And sometimes you're like, how did this happen? <laughs> um, this and then you a listen lot to the like last week's episode. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, so it is a little overcomplicated. Um, the thing is like, they'll have two people who are experts in the field, often very different perspectives um, go back and forth. And sometimes they have a copacetic one where everyone is like, oh, yeah, we're on the same page. Like, we both agree that this is the best Billy Wilder film. Or people are like, no, you are wrong. His comedies are shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> they do ones where they they did a series where they ranked every single Steven Spielberg movie. Um, they've done – I started listening for, like, Agatha Christie and Shakespeare adaptations, um, 70s conspiracy theory. Uh, like, they get very specific, very broad. Um, I have enjoyed it uh, arguably more when it is a blind spot for me. Um, I've, I've enjoyed listening to something where I've seen all the movies and I have opinions and feelings on the ranking, but I've liked it more for something like 70s conspiracy th thrillers, which I have seen none of, but I really want to hear like, why is um, day three days of the condor, which everyone kind of says is one of the epitome. Like, why did they put it in at seven? And both were like, yeah, no, it's okay. Like there are six movies that are better than this. Like that is fascinating to me. You hmm. see these lists online and they, you get no context of like the human being behind it. And like, if they agree or not, there's no debate. And because people have to defend their spots, there's more debate here. I really want to host a um, snake style draft podcast where like you nate and shane have to rank like platform like something that i'm like 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 the f best fighting games we've covered on the show like something i'm not going to be good at and you guys all have to do their own rank and ranked list um i think it's fun like you get one veto great actually like that's, that's you do trivia at the beginning to decide one. who gets what slot so some get to put more picks and some get number one like it's it's a wild time. And if you like discussion of movies and debates of movies more than like, um, it also kind of punctures the whole, like there is a canon mm -hmm. because someone is going to put becoming Jane on the Jane Austen adaptations list. And you're going to be like, how was there no adaptation of Emma on this list? And becoming <laughs> Jane is on it. <laughs> um, it's wild. It's a good time. If you like longer episodes or you really like kind of listening to a podcast over several days, it's it's an excellent, excellent time. Mm. RIP Waypoint Radio, who put out, you know, two to three hour podcasts twice or three times a week. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with my time anymore now that they're closing down. Um, yeah. RIP. I well, I'll, I'll have to check out. Sc sorry, you said screen screen right? drafts. Yeah, screen and drafts. they just did a music documentaries one, and I was all excited. And then I was like, none of these are streaming anywhere, and the library has none of them. So I'm gonna oh, go. I don't know, log on to Canopy or something, and see how I can watch these excellent. Um, I mean, I learned about movies I've never heard of, and people feel so excited about them. Like I am kind of moving past the point where I need to see like the AFI top 100. I'm more like, what is your personal favorite movie? And why is it bug starring Ashley Judd? And why should I bother to go out of my way to watch this weird movie? Like that's been really fun. I have to check that out. I don't listen to a ton of film podcasts, although I know that's like a super popular genre, mostly just because I don't, I don't watch that many movies. I just spend a lot of time because I, um, I don't know why, like, you know, something about having kids, it just, it like, it, it ate into my movie watching. You feel time guilty, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
But um, I do listen to the Letterbox podcast, which I think mm. has a has a nice format, and that they like interview guests, and they you know they have them. Letterbox has that thing where you pick like your top four movies to stick on your profile, um, yeah. And so they have like their guests talk through like. And I refuse to do that, even though it's I'm hard. Actually, like <laughs> listeners, you can find me on Letterboxd if you would like. That's true. I um, never, you know, I, I'm on Letterboxd too, but I don't use it that often because like I watch like two movies a year. Um, I watch. I'm I'm in a bit of a dry spell, but I. That's a bit of an exaggeration too, but like, yeah, I, I I'm Laura J dash at Letterboxd. If you want to not see me write reviews, but be like, why is Laura watching this thing out of nowhere? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I just, don't write reviews on it too much either, but I do sometimes log what I'm watching just so I can look back and be like, actually, I did watch movies this year, even though it sometimes feels like I didn't. Um, but that's a fun website, you know, second plug Letterboxd. No, I, I love letter. I, I love using letterbox to track if I've seen a movie or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm absolutely m- diligent about recording my activities and my, um, like every movie I've watched, but I do not tend to write reviews or rate anything. I'll just do hearts. Yeah, um, so you can look at my hearts for a Google very reads, strange, so just log what I've read. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know, but I honestly, if I had to pick a secondary making me happy for Letterboxd, it would be that um, my twin sister has recently started it and has been writing the, the just her reviews are so specific to her brain and they have <laughs> no, like, like she talked about, like she's reviewed the rock and she has reviewed, um, she just reviewed all the president's men and was like, two and a half stars do not have a understanding of Watergate after watching this movie. And the typewriters are really loud. And I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) I was like, that's totally fair. But like, nobody would dare puncture all the president's men that way. And she's like five stars out of Africa. One of the best yard sales I've ever seen. (laughs) (laughs) Like, Uh. if, 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 if I was famous, she would be an influencer on Letterboxd. I feel like I know more about her now. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. It's great. Uh, man, that's great. Well, um, we'll leave it here. And thank you for joining us this week on The Short Game. You can find our show on the internet at shortgame.fm. That's a place where you'll find links to all the stuff. You'll find a search box for our show notes. Uh, you'll find uh, links to us on various socials. I'm on Mastodon and everything. Um, you'll find our show on Mastodon and Twitter. Um, You can find, it's got a little mini player if you just want to play the show there, but also links to all the different podcast platforms. And why might you want that? You're already listening to the show, of course. Why, listener? It is because you may want to go to the podcast platform of your choice and leave us a review. That is how people find the show, and we really, really appreciate it. That's the number one way to support us. Apart from, oh, the, the number one way to support us is the Patreon. Patreon.com slash the short game, also on shortgame.fm. And uh, you can support the show. Even just a dollar a month gets you access to our Discord, where we talk about games and uh, and the episodes that we're doing and, uh, and plan things. And it's a great place to come if you just want to hang out or suggest a game yeah i will um, say that we had a lovely discussion after the uh last week's ranking episode so thank oh, you yes. to everybody who told us <laughs> that we were picking wild things or wanted to stand for their picks we appreciated all of it yeah yes thank you so much i had so much fun with that episode guys I, we should do that again someday but slightly different <laughs> maybe for the 10 year anniversary we'll do something different um and Laura, where can people find you on the internet? It's all linked on that uh, shortgame.fm page, but you can find me on Mastodon and, and I'm still on Twitter, but I'm not posting anything. Yeah. If you yeah. just have nostalgia. Mm-hmm. And Shane, where can people find you? You can find me the same. Uh, hit that uh, hit that short game page. You'll find links to my Mastodon and my Twitter. And folks, we are leaving it here because we were recording this crack early in the morning. Uh, my co-hosts both have to leave in order to go do their jobs, their actual work. Um, I have a few more minutes and uh, I I have a a burning thing I want to say that's spoilers. So we'll have a spoiler break here, but it's going to be me, myself, and I. So I'll say goodbye to Laura. Bye, Laura. Bye. Shane already dropped the call. Bye, Shane. Bye, Shane. And if you, uh, listeners, if you are curious about spoilers, uh, I'll be spending the next couple of minutes talking to myself about the endings of uh, or ending of uh, of this game. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, here it is my spoiler break. (laughs) 
All right, I think we're alone now. Welcome to the solo part of the podcast. Uh, there's not really that much. It's, it, I, I'm very awkward podcasting solo, and so maybe this was inadvisable. So uh, here we are. Um, but I did just want to talk a little bit about the endings, sort of, of this game. I was expecting to have multiple endings with um, with uh, Before the Green Moon. Um, throughout the game, you know, you're building up money, and I was fully expecting to be able to sort of choose to to not go. In fact, I really thought they were telegraphing something. There's a, there's a character called Int. He's the sort of, um, or she, I'm sorry, I don't remember Int's gender. Now I feel like a jerk. Um, I think Int was a she. Anyway, um, Int seemed to have a really, you know, seemed to be really motivated to go to the moon. And they were building a machine in their backyard for some purpose uh, get to that in a second. And I kept thinking I was going to be able to, like I bought my ticket and then I didn't, I carried it around for a little while and I thought I would donate, maybe I'd be able to donate it to Int to give Int an out, you know, to go onto the moon. Uh, cause here I am like, you know, raking in the moony selling cabbages. I could buy another one if I wanted. Um, but, uh, but it didn't seem to have that option. Um, but I did progress Int's story, uh, far enough that they did introduce me to granny a weird spectral green dripping woman who apparently was the person talking to int and telling int to build this machine in their backyard what on earth was granny she's a ghost of some kind i think and she she's telling int to build this thing that turns out to be a teleporter or like a portal and int goes through it and I think ends up on the moon, but it's not even clear. Um, and there's other people on the other side of this portal. You go in after Int, and there's there's other people there, and they're like, "How did you get here? What's going on?" And they ask Int if they like, you know, did you reactivate the portal? And like, they seem to kind of take Int captive. Um, but then Int says that they want to stay, I guess, because this is the moon, and they were wanting to leave. And and this whole scenario was such a confusing like story beat i i was like really intrigued by it but i I, like desperately wanted to know like well what is the deal with the the people on the moon call granny a moon ghoul what the hell is a moon ghoul and like how does that fit in this world and and what happens to int and um i thought that i you know Int was gone and i thought that must be the end of Int's story i didn't know what else to do um, and I had, I, you know, I'd come to what I thought was a pretty reasonable place to stop with everybody else's story. And so I thought I'd kind of exhausted my options. My, my farm was starting to become a burden in my life. And I was like, well, I guess I've got this ticket. It's probably time for me to go and, um, had a, uh, tearful and really kind of bitter goodbye with pony who I had, uh, created this, you know, this relationship with said goodbye to the other characters and then went up in the, uh, in the space elevator and, I thought the scene, you know, of of leaving was well done. I, I liked the way that they presented the uh, the credits. You 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 know, you have your cabin in the space elevator. You can sort of see the the Earth receding beneath you, and you can go and look at the TV in your cabin and see the end credits of the game, which I thought was interesting. Um, but like that's sort of the end, right? Like you you know, go up in the space elevator. You don't ever see the moon, um, apart from perhaps that scene with Int. Um, which is just an interior, and I don't really know, um, you know, what was going on there. And then I, I looked on the Steam community forums, and it it seems like I potentially missed some content with Int, um, where Int comes back from the moon or wherever they went. And I desperately want to see what happened there, but I think I'm just going to end up having to YouTube it because, uh, it, and hopefully somebody has YouTubed it because I haven't seen a whole lot of YouTube playthroughs of this, um, because. Uh, you know, apparently there's no way for me to go back. Once you go up in the elevator, that's it. And if I reload my save now, um, I just get the elevator sequence again, um, which is a bit of a bummer. I really would have liked to have had the option of doing a manual save before leaving. Um, you know, even if just because like I did find out after the fact that there's this content I potentially missed with Int and I was really involved in Int's story and I just really wanted to see it through. And I thought I had, even though it was strange, I thought, well, my, my initial thought was like, well, maybe I have to go to the moon to rescue Int, or at least maybe I'll get a scene with Int once I leave and, and get to the moon because I think that's where they are. Um, 
but that didn't seem to be the case. So anyway, I, I, I really deeply liked the story here. I thought that the, the romance with Pony was handled extremely well. Um, I thought that, you know, all of the other characters were interesting. Um, Int was fascinating and his bizarre, their, her, oh God, I keep mixing up Int's gender. Sorry, Int is a genderless character now. Um, I thought their, their story was, was really interesting. Um, but yeah, I I, uh, uh, I guess suppose if you're if you're the sort of person who listens to these spoilers um, before playing, um, you know, if you are wanting to see all of Int's story, uh, don't leave just yet. Um, but I'll, I'll probably have to YouTube it. And um, overall, I really super liked this game. So um, you know, I, I found myself really engrossed in it in a way that I, I at first was was like thinking I wasn't going to be because I don't play a lot of farming sims uh, or any really. It's just not a genre that I engage with. Um, but I did find the uh, the sort of mechanics of optimizing the farm kind of interesting. And I thought that the, the story was was involving and and quite good. Turn follow has a, has a knack for that. So um, uh, definitely recommend checking this out. I know I probably should have mentioned this earlier before the spoiler break, but I will hear because I don't think I did earlier. This game is available for PC on Steam and itch.io. Uh, and it is, I believe, 15 bucks. Let me double check that. Uh, looks like... Uh, 12 on itch.io and I'll assume that it's the same on Steam. So um, recommend checking it out. And uh, thank you for joining me uh, here in this weird solo after bit on the short game. <laughs>